Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's online service. Thank you, team, for that performance of America the Beautiful. And happy 4th of July to each of you. Pastor Bob is back this week from his vacation, and he's ready to share today's powerful message from our series, What Can We Learn from the Wisest Man in the World? I'd also like to thank our friends from Delmarva Adult Teen Challenge and Pastor Bruce for sharing their ministry with us last week. It was a real treat. Today is Independence Day for our nation. So let's get ready to enter into his presence with worship from Teen Challenges, talented worship band, followed by Pastor Bob's sermon from 1 Kings 8 titled, The Glory. Afterwards, please take a few extra minutes and watch Eagle's Nest announcements so that you can plan to worship, connect, and serve along with us. Happy 4th of July, everyone. Pray for our nation. Please enjoy the service. of my enemies It's your body your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battles Let's sing that again There's a table There's a table that you prepared for me 
in the presence of my enemies. It's your body, your blood, you shed for me. But this is how I fight my battles. And I believe you overcome. And I will lift my song of praise for all you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. In the valley. I know that you're with me Surely your goodness and your mercy follow me So my weapons are praise and thanksgiving This is how I fight my battles I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. And I 
I hear your invitation to let it all go. And I see you now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, oh. You saw my condition, the plan from the start. from my heart and I don't have a context that kind of love I don't understand I can't comprehend all I know is I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the high my heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again, or I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait, my heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father Sing that with me. My heart has been in your sight long before my first breath. I'm running into your arms. It's like running from life. So I run to the Father again and again and again, yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service. Happy 4th of July. I certainly hope that you have plans to celebrate. I know I do. Patty and I will be cooking some burgers and some hot dogs on the grill. I will eat until I'm stuffed, and then I'm going to do what I like to do best, and that is take a nap. You know, there was a day that I couldn't take naps. I mean, years ago, if I fall asleep in the middle of the day, I'd wake up groggy and grumpy, but, but now I'm groggy and grumpy without a nap. <laughs> Maybe I'm just grumpy. <laughs> but somewhere in my late 40s, naps began to become a good thing. And now I can take a 40-minute nap in the middle of the day, wake up refreshed, get work done, and still go to bed at my normal time at night and sleep like a baby. But that always wasn't the case. In fact, I like naps so much, I have renamed my lazy boy prayer. So now when people call the house and they ask for me, Patty will say, I'm sorry, he's in prayer. <laughs> I like my naps. And that's it. I guess I'm getting older. But before I left for vacation, uh, we were in a series called What We Can Learn from the Wisest Man in the World. And before I go into that to series today, I just want to say a heartfelt thank you to all of our volunteers and our staff, and all those that filled in while I was gone. My wife and I were able to take a week off and go south and go to the beach. And so I want to say thank you to everyone. We had some great services. I was so thrilled to watch them online. Everybody did a phenomenal job, and I just want to say thank you. It real, I, I told my wife as we were watching them, I said, you know what? I'm really not needed around here anymore. <laughs> this place can run itself. These guys can run this place all by themselves, they can preach, they can teach, they can sing, they can plant, I can do everything. I said, but I'm not planning to go anywhere. My hope is that though I may not be needed, I am wanted. And so they've really did a phenomenal job and I really wanna say thank you. And I want everybody to know how impressed I was with what they got done while I was gone. Now in our study of the life of Solomon, we've looked at the first seven chapters of 1 Kings. Solomon has become king. He was given wisdom by God. He became the wisest man in the world. He built a temple for God, and that's where we kind of left off, that he built a temple for God, and the nation was riding high. Everything was going great. And so today we come to chapter 8, which records the dedication of the Temple of Solomon. Now, three significant things happen at this dedication ceremony. First of all, in verses 1 through 13, they bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. That's that gold box that Indiana Jones put in the warehouse somewhere. But it's, it, it represents uh, the presence of God. And they brought this Ark into the temple. And when the temple, when the Ark was put into the temple, the Bible tells us that the manifest glory of the Lord, a visible manifestation of the Lord's presence came into the temple. That's in verses 1 through 13. In verses 14 through 61, Solomon prays for God's blessing on the temple that he built. And in verses 62 through 66, Israel celebrates one of their seven feasts, which is called the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, we'll come back to the prayer of Solomon another time. There's a lot of good stuff in that. But today, we're going to focus on specifically God filling the temple with his glory and the Feast of Tabernacles when the temple was dedicated. And the reason for this is that the two are connected and they are relevant to where we are as a nation on this 4th of July. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 through 13, the Bible says, actually, let's pick it up in verse 6 and then we'll skip to verse 10. It says, Then the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place, to the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim, for though cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. We drop down to verse 10. And it came to pass, when the priest came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. This is the cloud of God's glory, what's called the Shekinah glory of God. It is the manifest presence of God in the Old Testament. And so that the priests could not continue ministering. In other words, they had to stop their service in the temple because the presence of the Lord was so strong that they had to leave the temple. It said, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And then Solomon spoke and said, the Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. He said, I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell forever. Now, the ark that they brought into the temple symbolized 
I've been saying for years that it symbolized God's throne. And truthfully, I've been incorrect or imprecise in saying that. You know, as I said, it's God's throne. It represents God's presence, but specifically, it was actually God's footstool. The, the Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of the where God would stand. And in ancient cultures, a king would typically be on an elevated platform, and his throne would be above his subjects. And so the platform would be where his feet would land. And so the, the Ark of the Covenant is, is God's throne, but it's more like the throne is above the cherubim, and his feet would rest upon this ark. That's why the mercy seat, when we looked at the Ark of the Covenant weeks ago, we saw that the mercy seat had a flat platform on it, and the cherubim were on top of that mercy seat. That was God's footstool. That's where his feet would actually rest. And so that's what Israel would have understood in their culture when they saw a description or heard a description of the Ark of the Covenant. And so when the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the Holy of Holies, this was symbolic of God's throne room. The whole room, the whole holy place, the holy of holies, was symbolic of God's throne room. And above these cherubim, it was symbolic that God's throne would come down and his feet would stand upon the ark and he would make contact with mankind. And that's what this was a symbol of. And so when they brought the ark of, of the covenant into the temple, God's manifest presence filled the temple. And this is a way of God saying, I'm here is I'm filling this temple, I'm coming to rest. The idea behind here culturally is in the culture of Israel and the cultures around Israel, they built a lot of temples around Israel. And the idea was when you build a temple, the temple really wasn't finished until the deity came and rested or dwelt in that temple. And so what we have going on here is, is Solomon has built this temple. It's a beautiful temple. And God said he would fill the temple. And so what happens is he dedicates the temple. God's presence comes to rest in the temple. And so the language is loud and clear here. And what God is telling the people is he's saying, hey, guys, I'm here. I'm fulfilling my promise. I will dwell with you. And because I dwell with you, as we've seen in weeks past, my presence will protect you from the chaos of the world around you. And so there's a lot of things happening here as God, his presence enters the temple and his glory fills it. And so he's coming, God is coming to rest in his temple. Now, when we talk about rest and God resting, or even in the cultures around Israel, when they talked about a deity resting in, their, in the temple, they didn't mean that their God or God was taking a nap. His throne is not a lazy boy. In fact, the Bible tells us that, that God never sleeps and he never, he never takes a nap. He never slumbers. In Psalm 121, 3 through 4, it says, He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. God is not coming to rest in the temple to take a nap. In fact, the idea of God resting in the temple and culturally meant that God came into the temple to actually rule. And it's symbolic of him coming to rule in the land of Israel. And by his rulership, he was going to protect them from all the chaos around the world. He was going to bless them. And so as we look at this, keep in mind that the temple itself was powerless until the deity rested. Or the temple of Solomon was really powerless to protect Israel. It was actually God's presence among his people symbolized by the temple, and by his manifest presence coming into this temple, that his presence is what protected Israel. And so God coming into the temple, manifesting his presence, was simply a statement by God saying, I will rule over the people of Israel, and that is what will bring blessing to the nation. Now, we see this same idea in Genesis chapter 2. We've seen in other sermons in the past how in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, really the creation is the building of God's temple, that the original temple design comes from the book of Genesis and from the Garden of Eden. We've studied that in other sermons. But along the line, this idea of God ruling the earth and being the ruler of the earth and the earth being his temple kind of got corrupted, and that's why the pagan cultures around Israel tended to have all kinds of gods and goddesses and all kinds of crazy stuff. Well, 
they got their design originally from the scripture, from the, from the first temple, which is the Garden of Eden, and they corrupted it. And so what God is doing in Israel, as they built the temple, God is restoring them to the original order. And the idea behind it is that God would rule the earth through mankind, and he would rest upon the earth. That's the symbology that's happening here. And we see it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, when it says, on the seventh day, Speaking of the, the seventh day of creation, which took place in chapter 1, God ended his work, which he had done. Well, what was the work he had done? He had just created the heavens and the earth. And it says he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. So on the seventh day, he rested. Once again, the idea isn't that God said, you know, I'm done my work. The earth's created. I'm going to go leave. I'm, the idea of rest here is that the earth is God's temple, and now he's resting on the seventh day. He's not taking a nap on his lazy boy. He's sitting on his throne, and now his intention was to rule the earth through Adam and Eve and the human race but he's still the ruler of the earth. Now, that got messed up when Adam sinned, and the Bible talks about that in other places. And so now we have Israel where God is kind of like recreating everything. He's, he's created a nation. He, they, they are committing themselves to him by building a temple and by inviting him to rule the nation through them and to rule the earth. And so the cloud of glory filling the temple was quite significant and it was God's way of speaking their language. He's telling them, you built this temple, you've invited me to, to rule over your nation and rule over your lives, and I am here, and because I'm here, I've got your back. Now, in reality, the temple did not contain God. God is bigger than that little box that they built. God won't live in the boxes that we create for him. He's bigger than our boxes. But it was symbolic, God's saying, it's a symbolic gesture. God's speaking their language, saying, hey, you're inviting me to rule in your life, and I'll gladly do that. And let me just say this to all of us. Folks, let us invite God to rule in our lives. That is the secret to being protected from the chaos of our world. And that's the message that the Bible is giving us here. And so in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 through 2, we read about, and I'm going backwards, but I'm trying to get you to see what happened, and now I'm trying to help you to see why. They're dedicating the temple. In verses 1 through 2, it says, Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chiefs and fathers of the children of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. Therefore all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast, which we'll talk about in just a moment, in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And so what happens here is Solomon's dedicating the temple. He's gathering the nation together for this dedication. And God comes to rest in the temple. However, this dedication ceremony took place during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles took place in the seventh month of the year, but the temple had been finished in the eighth month of the previous year, Solomon waited 11 months before he dedicated the temple. And the question is, why? Why would Solomon wait 11 months to dedicate the temple waiting for the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, that's a great question. You are so good students to ask such an astute question. Well, first of all, the Feast of Tabernacles took place in October. It was kind of a harvest party celebration that celebrated and honored God for bringing in the harvest of that year's crops. It was the last festival of the year, and it was a, it was a celebration of the bounty of the harvest. Now, Solomon waits these 11 months because not only was this feast a celebration of bringing in the harvest, it was also a commemoration. It commemorated Israel's wandering through the desert and the ending of their wandering in the desert for 40 years in their early history. And so during this festival, which took place for seven days, they actually had to build these booths and live in them during this week that they celebrated this feast. So it's a week-long feast that celebrated God's goodness and taking care of them and bringing in a bountiful harvest. And it also commemorated how God led them through the wilderness and brought them out of their wilderness wanderings to rest in the land of Israel. Because the Feast of Tabernacles 
is symbolic of Israel resting in the land. So rest is the theme here. God comes to rest in the temple, which means rulership. God rests in the temple, in the land, to rule the nation of Israel. And the idea of rest, as I said, is a major one. In fact, it's a major one in all the Bible. God commanded Israel to rest on the Sabbath. God commanded Israel to rest the land every seven years when you study the Old Testament. God promised to give Israel rest from their enemies. God promises to give us rest in heaven. Rest is a big deal in the Bible. And so when God comes to rest in the temple, he's ruling. And when Israel is resting in the land, they are experiencing God's presence and God's blessings to be able to serve him. Because just like God resting in the temple was not inactivity, Israel's resting in the land was not in inactivity either. When God had Israel rest in the land and this building of the temple and this the God's manifest presence coming into the temple were a symbol. It was a pinnacle of 480 years of what God was trying to do in the land was to become the ruler of the nation and to bless his people. But it did not mean that we're now going to take a nap in their lazy boy. No, just as God's resting symbolized rulership in the temple, Israel's rest in the land symbolized their representing God in the earth through serving him. The idea here is that God brought Israel into the land to represent him in the earth by serving him. And so God's protection and blessing on the land would produce peace so that they could serve God unhindered. In fact, this idea runs all the way up into the birth of John the Baptist. You know, in the New Testament, when John the Baptist was born, right before Jesus was born, the Bible speaks of John the Baptist's father being told that he was going to be the father of John the Baptist, who was going to be a forerunner of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But in verses 74 and 75 of Luke chapter 1, when, when John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, is prophesying about this, he says some strange words. He says that God is going to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. The idea that he's speaking here is the same idea that is being communicated in 1 Kings chapter 8. And that is, he's talking about God giving them rest. This is when John the Baptist was born, so that they could serve God un unhindered in holiness and righteousness. Well, that's what's happening in the time of Solomon. They've established his temple. They've invited God to rule over their lives. God's presence comes in. And what is God doing? He's giving them rest. Why? Not so they can get lazy, not so they can take every day of the week off and never do anything. The idea is that they would have rest from their enemies and they would have margin in their lives of trying to eke out a living, that they would have margin in their lives so they could serve God every day of their lives, and represent him well in the earth. Folks, the truth of the matter is, is no matter how much we want to serve God, there are times in our lives where life gets so chaotic, so demanding, it's hard to serve him. And God understands that. So if you're in a season right now where you're trying to work out everything in your life and life is difficult and you're struggling because to serve God at the level you want to serve him, under, know that God understands and that's why he brings Israel a level of rest and peace so that they can serve him in the earth. Now, I'm going to connect this to where we are in America in just a moment. So just hang on with me. Right now, I'm trying to establish the, the idea behind what I'd like to say here this morning. And so the bringing in the ark into the temple and the glory of God coming into the temple were the fulfillment of what God had promised Israel for 480 years. He's saying... I promise to dwell with you. I promise to dwell with you and bless you and to protect you. And that's what God's doing here. And now, because of that, which we saw in previous weeks, now Israel, like Solomon, could represent God to the world. And so 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 24 says, Now all the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. Now, you might be thinking, Pastor Bob, this is great, but what does this have to do with America and the 4th of July? Well, everything. 
everything, and here's why. There was a connection, and there's a connection being made in 1 Kings chapter 8 between God resting in his temple and Israel resting in the land. And basically throughout the rest of the history of Israel, as the temple will go, so the nation will go. And so when Israel allowed God to be the ruler of their nation, when they allowed God to rest in his temple by invitation and asked him to be the Lord of their lives, the land enjoyed rest. The land enjoyed prosperity. The land enjoyed protection from chaos. But we read in the rest of Kings and we read in the books of the prophets when the land of Israel forsook the Lord, they lost their rest. And eventually God moved out of the temple. And so what's happening here is there is a message being sent to Israel and there's a message being sent to us. And we see it even in the life of Solomon. When Solomon was young, he served the Lord and the land had rest. 1 Kings chapter 5, 4 says, But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. This is Solomon speaking in his early days. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. In other words, I have peace. I don't have any chaotic forces controlling my life. Now, it took a while to get there, just like it does with us. And he says, And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. Because Solomon had peace, and he didn't have all these battles to deal with, and because God was the ruler of his life, and because he's the ruler of the king of Israel, and Israel serving God, they now have the ability to dedicate themselves to doing God's work and building the temple. And so God was giving them, a re was giving them rest and, and fulfilling his covenant with the land nation of Israel. It wasn't the ark of the covenant itself, it was the presence of God. And so we learn, however, and we'll see this a little bit more next week, that later in his life, Solomon forsakes the Lord. And guess what happens? Solomon begins to experience chaos and disruption. It says in 1 Kings 11, 11, because you have done this, and we'll look at this more closely next week, and have not kept my covenant. It's talking to Solomon. Solomon's the guy who built the temple. Solomon was serving God, but somewhere along the way he gets off course. And he says, now God's saying, because you've done this and you're not following my commandments, which I gave you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Folks, there is a connection being made here between God resting in the temple of Israel, God ruling over Israel, and their resting in the land and having peace and being protected from chaos and disorder. And folks, I want to say this morning that there is a connection between America's rest in the land and God's rest in our temples. America will only have rest in our land if God rests in our temples. Today we celebrate the 4th of July as the birth of our nation. And in some ways it really is because it's when we declared our independence. But in reality, in actuality, our nation was born on April 30th, 1789. For the government that we enjoy right now did not come into existence on July 4th. It came into existence on April 30th, 1789 after the ratification of our Constitution and the installment of George Washington as our first president. Upon being sworn into office, George Washington gave the very first presidential address. In this address, Washington acknowledges the hand of God in the founding of this nation when he states, No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than those of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. Let me put that in modern English. Folks, America wouldn't be America if God wasn't with us. And so the first thing he's saying as president of the United States and the birth of our current government and nation is that we are a nation by the providential hand of God. But he didn't stop there. Upon being sworn into office, Washington issued a prophetic warning to this nation when he said, we ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and the right which heaven itself has ordained. Folks, this is another way of saying, by our very first president, there is a connection 
between America's allowing God to rest in our temples and America's rest. It doesn't stop there. Upon being sworn into office, Washington led the Senate and House of our government to St. Paul's Chapel, where he dedicated this nation to God. You know, a lot of people don't know this history. This history is not being told today. But our first president dedicated the United States of America to God, just as Solomon dedicated the temple of God to, to, to God in Israel. Now, we don't know exactly what he said in St. Paul's. That's not been recorded for us. But we do know that it was a dedication to God because, first of all, in Washington's presidential address, he said this. He said, it would be peculiarly improper to admit in this first official act my fervent supplications to, to the Almighty Being. In other words, he's saying, it wouldn't be right for me as the first president and my first action not to pray to God who rules over the universe, who presides in the councils of nations, and whose providential aids can supply every human defect, that his benediction may consecrate to the liberties and happiness of the people of the United States a government instituted by themselves for these essential purposes. Now, folks, that's a mouthful. But basically what he's saying is we need to pray to God and we need to thank God for his blessing, that he has given us the ability to form a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And he's dedicating America to God. Secondly, we know that Washington dedicated America to God in St. Paul's Chapel because a proclamation was issued by our government stating, on the morning of the day on which our illustrious president will be invested with his office, the bells will ring at 9 o'clock when the people may go to the house of God and in a solemn manner commit the new government. Folks, this is being put in the papers. This is being advertised to the people. This is a proclamation by our government that the people may go to the house of God in a solemn manner and commit the new government, the new government with its important train of consequences to the holy protection and blessing of the Most High. An early hour is prudently fixed for this peculiar act of devotion and is designed wholly for prayer. Folks, there goes separation of church and state right there. Our founding fathers, our first president and our founding fathers dedicated this country to God and they started the country that way and they even started with a prayer for our nation, for God's blessings. Now on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, the connection between God resting in America's temples and America's rest became apparent. As you know, on 9-11, two planes flew into the north and south towers of the World Trade Center. We call this Ground Zero. If you've never been to Ground Zero, I would encourage you to take a trip to Ground Zero. It really is a hallowed piece of ground, and it will change your life. My wife and I had the privilege of going several years ago. But Ground Zero, did you know where Ground Zero is? It's located in the back of St. Paul's Chapel where George Washington, our first president, dedicated this nation to God. In fact, the land the Twin Towers were on was once belonged, once owned by St. Paul's Church. America was intact on the very ground where it was dedicated to God. I don't think that this is an accident. I don't think there's, this is insignificant. I think this is quite significant. And I believe, I don't believe God ordained that attack. I believe God didn't want that attack more than we didn't want the attack. But the attack happened, and I believe it served as a wake-up call and a reminder to us on this 4th of July. You know, as I prepared this 4th of July message, I usually like to have a, a really high-energy, celebratory message, have some hot dogs and hamburgers, enjoy your freedom. But I feel like as, we, as we've been through all this COVID stuff and all the chaos that's going on in our culture right now and in our country, it'd be appropriate for me to come up and act like none of that's happening. What's going on in America folks, is directly related to who's ruling in our temples. What the chaos that we see in, that seems to be stalking us in America is directly related to how much of God's rulership we want over our land. 
And so on this 4th of July, what we learn from the wisest man in the world is this. When God rests, we rest. When God rests in our temples, when he's the ruler of our lives, we will enjoy. We, will, we may be in chaos now, but we'll work out of that chaos. And so if we have chaos in our lives, folks, it, it, and we let God rule, he'll begin to bring order out of that chaos. But when we don't let God rest in our temple, when we don't let God rule our lives, folks, we begin to experience disorder, chaos, and confusion. And we see that everywhere in our country. Truth of the matter is, America doesn't need a nap. And ironically, we need to wake up. We need to wake up to the reality that when God rests and rules in our land, we will have peace and we will have prosperity and we will have blessing. Why? Not so that we can do our own thing, but so that we can serve God without hindrance and without fear and we can represent Him in the earth. Today, as we celebrate the birth of our nation, we find ourselves in a battle, really, on who's going to reside, who's going to rule, who's going to rest in the temple of America. Will it be us or will it be God? And so today, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to celebrate our independence, celebrate your freedom. Folks, we have enjoyed a freedom and a prosperity as a people like no other people, and we need to thank God. And one of the ways we thank God is we celebrate. So celebrate. Eat some hot dogs, eat some hamburgers, take a nap, gather some people together, have a great time today, but make sure you remember the point we're making today, that the freedom we enjoy is directly related to God resting in our temples. But I'm going to ask something else of you. Today I'm going to ask you, maybe even tomorrow, Monday morning, Monday afternoon, celebrate July 5th as a day off and that kind of thing. But I'm going to ask you, after July 5th, I'm going to ask you to join me in repentance, prayer, and fasting for this nation. I'm going to ask you that this week after we celebrate and had a good time and enjoyed our time together and our time off, I'm going to ask you to join with me in personal repentance and prayer and fasting for this nation. I believe that God is not finished with America. In fact, I've said in other Fourth of July sermons, I've said that I believe that America was created in the first great awakening. I believe America was sustained in the second great awakening. And I've said before, I believe this nation will be rebirthed in a third great awakening. And that's what I'm calling you today to join me in. Is folks, America has problems right now. America is going through a chaotic time, a time like we've never seen before in our history. And now I'm calling you, the church of Jesus Christ, to rise up and pray and seek God's face for the well-being of our nation. Because if we, God's people, will invite God to rule over our lives again, He will free us to serve and represent Him again to our nation, and our nation will, experiencing, will experience an awakening and a revival and a return to God dwelling again in our temples and if God dwells in our temples and rests in our temples, then America's freedom will be perpetuated and we will enjoy the blessings of God. In closing, let me say that, folks, we don't have to be in the majority to turn our country around. We don't have to be the majority to bring order out of the disorder. We just have to be consecrated to God and dedicated to God. We, as followers of Christ, just simply need to repent of our sin. Repent of our taking back God's rulership and ruling in our own lives and begin to seek His face for our lives and for our nation. We can make a difference in this country and for this country and for our kids and our grandkids if we'll just seek God in prayer. So join me. And I'm going to ask you to join me in closing prayer, and I'm going to ask you as the weeks go forward, as I say more about this, I'm going to ask you to join me and those at Eagle's Nest in fasting and prayer and repentance and asking God to return to our temples and bless our land. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning as we wrap up this message, no one person is enough, but Lord, you also don't need a majority. You just need your people who are called by your name to seek your face, to humble ourselves, to turn from our wicked ways, to seek your face and ask you to return to rulership and lordship and to rest in the temple of our lives 
and you promise that you'll return. And Father, we also, as we do that, we ask you to return to the temples in America and bless our nation with a third great awakening that turns people's hearts and minds back to you so that you once again can rule our nation and restore the order and the peace, the prosperity and the blessings that, Father, I know that you want to, to bring to us. So, Father, bless those that are hearing this message. Call us your people to gather and seek your face. And on this 4th of July, we pray, bless the United States of America with revival and awakening and come be our Lord. We ask us in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. God bless you. I hope to see you next week. What is it like to experience God's presence, his glory? As a human, it's pretty overwhelming. We can't handle it. We can't even stand in it. Everything must yield to his presence, his glory. Let me ask you this morning, do you crave that, his presence, to be in his glory? We can meet him there in our prayer life. We can experience it when we read about him, when we sing praise and worship to him, and in so many other ways. There's nothing like it. Often during our praise and worship time at Eagle's Nest, it's my prayer that God would show up with his presence and fill the place and allow our worship to be pleasing in his sight. In his presence, his glory is peace. It is love, it is holiness, it is restoration, forgiveness, protection, and blessing. It's a place that we can find rest in and we can find refuge in his glory. Well, good morning and welcome to Eagle's Nest. Happy Independence Day. We thank you for worshiping along with us online. If this is the first time you've experienced Eagle's Nest online, we would love to know that. Send us an email to hello at eaglesnest.ch so that we can greet you properly. Besides our website, eaglesnest.ch, follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, our YouTube channel, and consider signing up for Realm. That can help. Each of those ways can help you stay connected with us where you can find tons of resources, videos, teachings, and messages as well as give online to Eagles Nest Ministries if you'd like using PushPay or Realm. Eagles Nest Kids is meeting live every week and being enjoyed by our kids. That's from nursery to fifth grades. Let me encourage you, parents or grandparents, if you have friends with young children, maybe they've been in isolation for this past year or so, it's been a weird one for sure, invite them out to try Eagles Nest Kids on Sunday mornings with you. It is our privilege to care for your kids. The next middle school hangout is on the calendar. It's happening Friday night, July 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. There will be fun games, food and fun, and a devotional with Tim Tebow's Shaken series. That is now open to all grades 5th to 9th. So parents, please sign up your middle schooler now. In other news, we've held communion today in our live 4th of July service. Next week, Sunday, July 11th, is our baptism service. And we're also going to be celebrating the first half of 2021 with a special custom video presentation from Eagle's Nest. Ladies, check out Realm for the next lineup of Bible studies. We know there's one starting up very soon on Monday mornings. Men, you're on your own. Our next Bible study starts in the fall, and we have tons of men's events popping up here and there over the summer. So please stay tuned as well. You can go to Connections Corner when you're here in the building, Realm, or our website, eaglesnest.ch, to stay in the know and get signed up. Other church-wide events starting from further out, we're setting up an Eagle's Nest marriage conference. That'll be in early October for couples to have a date night out together. If you have a little one that you'd like to dedicate to the Lord, please sign up now. That's happening September 12th during our morning service. And we're planning to get group tickets for a Delmarva Shorebirds game together. It'll be later this month at the end of July, maybe even into early August. It'll be an Eagle Nest family night out at the ballpark. More to come soon on the date. I do have a date for you. Please save this date and please plan to be here because all of you are invited to the Eagle's Nest Family Summer Picnic. It's happening Wednesday evening, July 21st at 6 p.m. right here on the Eagle's Nest campus. We're going to fire up all the grills. We'll be providing burgers and dogs, drinks, and all the trimmings. And we're asking our families to come out and bring your favorite side dish or dessert to share. We're bringing out the big guns. We're going to have music, large inflatable bouncy things for kids of all ages, youth and adults too, tons of yard games, bocce ball, cornhole, horseshoe, you name it. And I've even heard rumors that we're getting a dunking booth this year set up for you to dunk your favorite 
or maybe your least favorite Eagle's Nest staff member. Mark your calendar now. Sign up. It's July 21st. Reschedule your vacation if you have to. You're going to want to be here with us for good old-fashioned summer fun together. And if you'd like to help with setup, tear down, grilling, that'd be awesome too. You can go to Connections Corner when you're here or Realm for more. If we can minister to you spiritually in any way, we ask that you reach out to us. We'd love the opportunity to pray with you, counsel, give advice, or whatever it is that you need. It'll be discreet and simple. Please send us an email to hello at eaglesnest.ch and one of our staff members will connect with you. I want to thank you all for being a part of our special 4th of July online service. As a reminder, we do meet live every single Sunday at 930 and it includes Eagles Nest Kids. Next week, come on out early, plan to celebrate for baptism and much more. Hope you have a great week, everyone. Take care.